Hi, everyone. I'm Shane Graham. I'm the Interim Policy Director for Weston for Congress. And thank you for joining us for this policy lunch with Kale Weston. The video of today's session, by the way, will be posted on our YouTube playlist when that's available. And Julie will be posting a link to that to the chat room. Um, and you can see the past sessions that are already there, including last week's uh, policy lunch on civil rights. Today, Kale is going to be talking about issues that are important to all of us, issues around jobs and the economy. If you haven't been to the website, westonforcongress.com and read the issues page, especially if you haven't done so in the last two or three weeks, I encourage you to do so. Um, we've fleshed that out with a lot of new language and the link under economic recovery is particularly relevant to today's lunch and lays out a lot of ideas and principles that Kale endorses. I've been involved with Kale's campaign um, since the early days, and these statements really solidified my, my support, made me remember why I'm involved with the campaign, and made me really proud to be part of it all. So check those out. Um, we're going to start off with Kale saying a few words on his thoughts about the economy, and then we'll try to pretty quickly open it up to questions and answers. Um, so please be thinking of questions. Go ahead and write them in the chat room. You can direct those to Julie. Um, and we want this to be an interactive and dynamic experience, and we're going to try to push Kale to articulate his policy ideas. Um, just a few words about the technology here. If you could please keep yourself on mute while Kale speaks, that'll avoid the feedback problems that we're all familiar, familiar with. Um, use the chat feature to ask questions during the remarks. Um, and you can control how your screen appears. If you look at the top right corner of your screen, um, you can choose either grid view, which gives you a three by three view that gives um, as many people as will fit on the screen at a time um, equal size, or you can go to speaker view, which enlarges the video of the person who is currently speaking. Um, so let's get started. Again, please direct your questions to the chat room and we'll answer as many of them as possible. Kel, do you care to take it away? Uh, thank you, Shane and, and Julie, for helping us lead off on our second to our final policy lunch. So I guess we call it the pe penultimate, if I've got that word right. Uh, our, our next one won't be next week because we'll be on the road, but we'll be the following week. And our great team will make sure all of you are aware of, of the specifics of that. And that'll be accountability and ethics in government. But I always know it's going to be a good afternoon when I pull out the blue shirt from my closet and I get to hear good questions from all of you. So uh, I wanted to start with, you know, kind of a little bit of personal, which is some of you know that I, of course, represented our great country for 11 years almost, but my, my I guess the dignity of work can come in my view from, from many places and, and with many different job descriptions or job titles. And, you know, if we all look back on those first jobs we had, or maybe even some of the hardest jobs we've had, or perhaps the lowest paying jobs relative to the highest paying jobs. I think work is a very interesting concept. And I think if there's one theme um, in my middle age that I come back to, and I think that why I'm running and why policy should, should focus on this theme is the dignity of work. And I don't think there's only one definition of dignity when it comes to work. Uh, I worked at Dairy Queen making blizzards and scrubbing uh, oily, greasy floors. I worked the fryer, you know, for the French fries. I did a lot in that role for one summer, and at the age of 16, made I, re I believe it was around three dollars an hour. And I remember how proud I was after four months before going off to college. I had about six or seven hundred dollars saved, if that. Um, and then, I, of course, I delivered pizzas um, also for Godfathers, and learned a lot about what it's like to do two jobs in one day. And then you've heard some of me that I was a public parks maintenance crew member for three summers in a row. And that's not entirely fun work, especially after Little League games and you're scrubbing toilets. But as I got older and I, I put on the suit and tie and, and sat officially in the State Department, I think some of those experiences did uh, stay with me. And again, it gets to this concept of dignity. So I wanna start off with, with a story um, and then break the 10 or 15 minutes I have into four sections and I owe Shane and our policy team a lot for putting white papers to me because of course even as a fairly well-read and motivated candidate I am not an expert on every issue so they put together a lot of good information that I'll be referring to but before I tell the story I'm going to uh, read a headline uh, that came across the Washington Post and Shane thank you for flagging it to me it, it's literally a headline as of about 10:30 Mountain Standard Time 
And what it is, is it, it's, it's an article titled Top CEOs Call for Quote Major Coronavirus Stimulus to Keep the Economy from Backsliding. This is the business roundtable, and these are big CEOs, you know, that are running big corporations. And one of their messages, I think, that's important is that, hey, this is not over. While there seems to be some stabilization going on, um, and maybe hopefully the worst is behind us, our government, which doesn't yet have a, a, an agreement on another big round, uh, is stuck and blocked. So I just wanted to, to reference you to that um, and read a quote uh, from the president of the roundtable, uh, which again, this all cuts against this idea that, you know, helping people and putting people first in a time of great economic need is somehow socialism or somehow not needed or somehow government handouts to the wrong people. So Bolton, Joshua Bolton, who's again, the, the chief executive of the business roundtable says further major support from the federal government is necessary to prevent economic recovery from being derailed. Uh, failure to act, along with the lack of comprehensive and coordinated efforts to stop the spread of COVID, would impose long-term damage to the U.S. economy, hurting, mo hurting most the workers and small businesses least able to absorb the blow. They then reference, and there's a reminder, of course, of the 200,000 deaths through COVID. Um, and then at the end, the, the CEO of Walmart uh, makes the comment, as CEOs of America's largest employers continue to work with lawmakers and public health, health officials at all levels of government to ensure safe reopenings across the country, um, the Business Roundtable urges the administration and Congress to come back to the negotiating table and pass more legislation to further ease the economic challenges American workers, small businesses, and suppliers are experiencing. So again, as a candidate with your support, I am giving voice to a couple of key themes here, which is this pandemic led to some decisions to keep public health front and center. Consequence of that, and we saw some, I think, strong leadership locally in our state, particularly with the mayors, is that these businesses and, and people are still hurting. And yet, Mr. Stewart and Congress seem to come up with reasons why uh, nothing's being done uh, and may not be done through election day. So that's the context. I wanted to circle back um, to the story I wanted to tell and keep in mind kind of this idea of, of dignity. Um, I was on a Twilla podcast with a bunch of listeners who generally don't vote Democratic, uh, but it's hosted by two capital L libertarians. And we did end up talking about work. And one of the points I made there is I believe almost everyone wants, wants, wants a job, wants to, to find that dignity of what it means to earn a paycheck. And it doesn't mean it's one kind of job. It doesn't mean it's you know, an hourly wage job or a high, high paying job. I think that, that instinctively, I believe most people want that. But the story I wanna tell is about a friend's grandmother who is, uh, is in the TPS program, the Temporary Protected Status Program through our really um, dysfunctional and, and, and inhumane in many ways immigration system. She immigrated from Honduras um, uh, through TPS, finally uh, got into that program and is now uh, cleaning Dodger Stadium uh, at the age of 74 and 75, around there. And of course, she goes to work every day. She's not Zooming like we are. And the part of the story I want to tell is there are a lot of people like her uh, who are hurting. They're women, they're minority communities, communities of color. And I think what we need to keep in mind as we work through maybe our discussion today that that what COVID has done is really hit them the hardest. And I know we've, we've mentioned that before, but the part of the dignity gets to the other job that she has. Um, in addition to cleaning Dodger Stadium, she cleans the home of a wealthy person. And um, I heard a story about once when she was reaching to grab some coffee, she grabbed a mug and thinking it was fine. And this person tended to say, well, it's not fine. This is not a mug that you should drink. And I don't want to pick on anyone in particular. I don't know the, the homeowner, but I think work is tied to dignity. And I think how we treat each other is fundamentally tied to dignity. And when unemployment goes up, the sense of dignity goes down. And I think what good governing and good policy means is that we find ways to get people back to work, to have a living wage that can enable them to afford uh, what, what everyone wants, which is peace of mind and the ability to keep your kids in school and to, and to pay your rent or pay your mortgage and um, to pay your health care. 
All right. So those are kind of some of the principles I start off with. People want to work, and that if you get good policy, you can you can help people get back into the job uh, uh, employment category, even with a challenge like COVID. I also want to remind us all, and what I remind myself when anyone is interviewing me is that when we talk about what it's going to cost to help people, let's always remember that there are decisions and priorities that predate COVID. A tax cut of $1.5 trillion plus is relevant, I think, when we talk about what can we afford and, and why and, and, and how we ought to go about getting some better legislation out of Congress. In 1929, and you probably won't see my big arm, I'm going to try and do it this way, but the gap you know, between low income and high income was as high as it's ever been. And you fast forward to February of, of, of 2020, and it was about the same gap. What COVID did is mix it all up. So what Shane's provided me, I want to get into as far as the last six months or so and what that what that has meant for people. But I always like to say that let's not forget when everyone was talking about a booming economy, uh, it really wasn't booming for a big chunk of our country. I'm a candidate who doesn't own stock, not necessarily by choice, but because I'm a teacher and a writer and I've had to make some tough financial decisions myself. But that February time frame before the crash, before COVID, was an incredibly uh, stark reminder, in my view, about how much that inequality has risen um, to the point where I don't think it was sustainable. And I think COVID proved, obviously, that, that it wasn't, but for other reasons. So the hardest hit uh, when COVID uh, came our way, of course, we're women, we're communities of, of color. I want to just talk about a bit of facts. I think they're important in data. Um, in, in the second quarter of this year, GDP dropped by 30% um, from the peak. Um, prior to that, the lowest drop in prior recessions, and we can go back you know, into 2008 to 89 period, uh, was 4%. So you can see the, the significant scale of the drop of GDP. Unemployment um, from a low of 3.5% in February peaked, give or take, at about just under 15%. Uh, uh, by by late spring, currently it looks like national unemployment numbers are about eight eight and a half percent. Utah's lower than that. So while there has been an, a, an improvement, it's still quite significant relative uh, to where we were. I want to read a quote by an MIT economist. His name is David Autor, and he says the pandemic changing the labor market is changing the labor market and a disaster for the lowest paid workers in the U.S. At least 4 million private sector workers have had their pay cut and workers are twice as likely to get a pay cut than during the Great Recession. And salary cuts have even spread among white collar workers. So while it's disproportionately toward uh, lower income hourly wage who you know, show up every day and, and don't get on a computer to work, it has also affected uh, white collar workers. There's the cutting of hours and about 6 million people have been forced into part-time work. So I think each of us can look around our neighborhoods or know people that have been affected this way. We, I know a lot of people who have been affected this way, and that, that's still, I think, uh, where our policy needs to be focused. Related to that is, is an important dimension of food insecurity, literally the ability to feed you and your, your, your family. And this is pretty stark. Um, Brookings, the, the institution back in D.C., uh, has come up with some data which says food insecurity is particularly high among households with children. And it doubled from 14% in 2018 to 32% in July 2020. So that's significant increase. 16.5% um, of American households report that sometimes or often they're not able to, to get enough food to, to provide for their families. Of course, in the minority communities, it's the same tragic data point. Three in 10 black households, uh, that's true, and one in four Hispanic households, and for white households, it's one in 10. So that's some of the data. I wanna now shift to a, a good paper that, that Naya, a uh, former student of mine, uh, put together. And again, it's just more of an overview of where we are and maybe with a little bit of a sense of how do we improve the situation when we're looking at what COVID has meant and in terms of poverty. So in 2018, there were 38.1 million people or about 11.8% who lived in poverty in the US. 16.2% of all children were living in poverty. 
that's almost one at, one out of every six. Uh, for the Native American population, indigenous is 25.4%. Uh, for for African American families, 20.8%, which is the second highest uh, rate. For Hispanics of any race, it's the third highest at about 17.6%. For, for white households, it's about one out of 10. And for, for Asian uh, households, Asian American uh, families, it's about 10% as well, according to this data. Taking that to Utah, which of course is one of my objectives running to represent about half the state geographically, um, if I were to quiz our class, uh, the rate is about 11%. Uh, whether we find that surprising or not, I think it's a significant, uh, significant number. More about Utah. Um, there's 1.1% of our population that's uh, black. Uh, median income is about 40,590. And that about 24% of people living under the poverty threshold in Utah are black. Uh, the indigenous population and Alaska native population is 0.9% of Utah's population with a median income of about $39,800. And they account for 28.9% of the people living under poverty. We could go into the uh, Latino communities as well. Bottom line is, is of course, even in Utah with a smaller percentage of minority populations, we still see the same trend uh, that's going across the country. Um, we have a very young population, which we all know about, but to the point of, of uh, food insecurity, we're also seeing the same trend here. And according to this paper that Naya put together, um, we have 12.9% of our households in Utah that experience food hardship uh, and food insecurity. So again, more data, I think, to focus our discussion. Uh, before we before we open it up into into questions, we'll eventually, I think, hopefully, get a time to talk about. So, how would we change this? What are the solutions we would find? But before I get there, um, I do want to highlight uh, where my opponent has been on some important pieces of legislation. I think now that we're five five into our policy lunches, I try and be fair. Uh, I try and be direct. But politics again should be about the political rap sheet of the guy you're trying to beat, but also what, what would you do differently? What are we Democrats standing for? And I think we've tried to strike a pretty good balance on that. So here's a few pieces of legislation I think that we ought to keep in mind. Um, HR 582, which was raised the, the Wage Act, it would have amended the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 to increase the federal minimum wage uh, for regular employees over a seven year period. Of course, no surprise, Chris Stewart voted against that. Um, there's the Pay uh, Paycheck Fairness Act, uh, which sought to make similar changes in terms of uh, people who might be discriminated against in their pay. Chris Stewart voted against that. There's HR 1500, uh, which is Consumers First Act. Uh, this bill uh, revises provisions related to the administration of the Consumer Financial Protection board, which of course was a, a big deal with a lot of work by uh, Senator Warren. Uh, so he voted against that. And then there's, of course, a labor bill that was quite important that has passed the House but is stuck in the Senate. And that's the PRO Act law, the Protect, Protecting the Right to Organize Act of 2019. I wanted to end there because we don't have probably as much time as we would like. But as I was preparing for today, I wanted to almost come up with a whole different section about uh, the state of labor and the state of unions and how that does affect, I think, that issue of dignity, uh, what is a living wage. And I think there'll be an opportunity between now and November 3rd to talk to voters uh, about how Utah used to be a more, it was never one of the top uh, labor states, but it had a much fairer, I think, sense of what is the proper role of labor. And in past policy lunches, I've often looked to the to other countries, you know, what's going on around the world uh, that we too could learn from. And I think sometimes our, our politicians are so myopic that they think that everything, including sliced bread, uh, was invented here. And I'm not sure sliced bread was even invented here. Um, but we need to look overseas at some models that actually uh, seem to have a better handle on what labor and the role of labor means for 
dignity and quality of life and, and work. And if you saw my last message to our list, I, I, I referenced the World Happiness Index. And while we don't have time to go into, into that today, if you are bored on a, on a Wednesday afternoon, uh, look into what, what factors go into when people describe the societies they live in as a, as a happy place to live. And I think that's important. And I think a lot of it does come to what is the work-life uh, relationship and how has government passed legislation, whether a small country or bigger countries, uh, to get a better result. Last two points I want to hit before we really do open it up to questions quickly. And I want to thank um, Nancy for, for sharing the rural online initiative program that's, that's underway right now. And those of you who have looked at our map and have been participating in our discussions know that in a district of 14 counties, including Salt Lake County and Salt Lake City, uh, this is a really important uh, frame to keep in mind when you look at jobs and, and, and trying to help people through legislation. And what's happened here with the uh, state level initiatives is how are we helping some of the most rural parts of the state to get better options, to get more job opportunities. So I just wanna give you an idea um, of what's going on uh, at the state level. And I think it's, it's a sign of some real improvement. So the, so the challenge is pretty straightforward, which is Utah's economy has experienced steady growth in recent years. However, the prosperity has not been ev evenly dis distributed. In rural counties, the unemployment rate has been as high as 10%. That's a 2017 figure. And in most communities, the unemployment rate has been more than double the state unemployment average, which has been around 3%. So again, rural, harder hit, fewer opportunities how do we how do we how do we change that so some of the actions are to divide up the state to three uh three regional areas and under the um initiative here uh the goals are increasing uh to, to address increasing unemployment intergenerational poverty which is what i hear a lot of when i'm in iron county and then the as i've said the export of young people outside of rural counties to the urban areas so since this program has been in place, uh, I think uh, there's been some positive outcomes so far, which is 10 counties that were focused on showed declines in the unemployment rate since the inception of the program. The average decline uh, in unemployment has been not huge, but about 0.2%. Um, they've awarded some scholarships to try and increase skills so that some of these rural areas can actually uh, get their people better educated and better ready uh, for the for the transition. The paper that I received um, had a study that I think is important to reference. Of the 281 participants uh, in the May to July 2019 cohorts, 71% uh, did not have remote work experience before the course. 92% um, said it was important to get that kind of uh, skill set of remote work. And then they've got some great quotes of, from some people who have lived through this program, and I don't want to read them all. We don't have time, but one, one stuck out to me as part of the success stories I think we're seeing when we, we focus resources in specific geographic areas. And they quoted Patsy from Emory County. Emory is not in the district, um, but she said, I managed our local newspaper for years until it was acquired. Not long after I found myself unemployed, I loved my community and had no desire to move, but was worried that I might have to. After completing the Master Remote Work Professional Certificate course, I was able to integrate my existing writing skills with what I learned in the course to become a successful freelance writer. I now contract with multiple clients and love working as a freelancer. So that's Patsy in Emory County. One success story, of course, as a freelance writer, if she's making it work, I. I, I, my hat's off to her because uh, that's uh, quite an accomplishment. Finally, and I'm gonna end here really with just a, a short overview, is what the role of um, our situation with the loan challenge, particularly for young people who, who take out loans and then try and find a way to, to pay off the loans in a reasonable way without getting stuck uh, in the trap of high loan, uh, getting a high loan amount and then not being able to get out ahead of it. So this is, I think, going to continue to be a hot topic. It doesn't seem like it is right now, but I think it's one that's underneath some of the headlines that we shouldn't forget about. Um, and some of the data to keep in mind, and I'll thank Christy 
uh, Fox who put this together. 43 million students have loan debt. That's $1.6 trillion in total. Some of the plans today are, should we forgive the loans? And how much of those loans should we forgive? I've said before, I graduated from undergrad and graduate school with about $25,000 of loan, loans. I did not pay off those loans till I got to Iraq. I do not endorse going to a war to pay off your loans, but that's kind of what it took me. Um, and I remember how happy I was when Nelnet, Nelnet got their last 380 or whatever dollars it was from me with a little coupon attached to an old fashioned check, I think. Um, that was then 20 or so years ago. Let's bring it forward to today. Because I think what's happened is, of course, that that debt level has just skyrocketed. And my students, some of you who might be on this call, helped educate me on that. So here's the scope of the problem. $1.6 trillion in student loan debt today in the U.S. There are 43 million borrowers. The average student loan debt for the class of 2019 is $30,000. Additionally, 14% of parents took out loans to pay for college. These are public colleges. So 66% of public college graduates have student loan debt. In Utah, the average loan debt is lower. It's about $16,600. Um, of course, same theme, who gets hit hardest when it comes to student loan debts? It's uh, disproportionately uh, minority communities. And I think that's something we need to keep in mind. And I think it's, of course, women as well, according uh, to this paper, women on average borrow 3,000 more than men and attain a degree and hold two thirds of the student loan debt. So what do we do about it? There's some good proposals uh, under consideration right now. Um, one, Senator Warren has gotten behind Chuck Schumer and Jim Clyburn, and that's to forgive, I've got, I think, a public works crew behind me, so hopefully you can hear. Um, but to forgive up to $50,000 of student loan debt. Again, I'm, I'm for looking very seriously at how to do that, uh, how to find a way to make that loan debt manageable. Just because I paid off my student loans the old fashioned way and the way I did it 25 years ago, I don't think that is something that applies as much today. I think that that debt level is disproportionately high. Um, there's another question about for-profit colleges versus public, uh, public colleges. When the pandemic hit, the CARES Act actually uh, did provide some relief to student loan borrowers. Uh, they were put into forbearance and interest was put at 0%. There's another good proposal out there in Congress, again, by Democrats which is, and Republicans. This is bipartisan. In fact, I think it's led by Lamar Alexander, who's a Republican out of Tennessee, which is to simplify uh, the FAFSA application. I filled out the FAFSA application and it's the free application for federal student aid. And what interestingly the data shows is that it, a complicated process like that actually prevents people from filling it out. So the Pell Grants aren't going to the people who need them. So those are four, four general areas um, I wanted to just hit in the overview and I took more time than I, I promised I would. So. Again, work is dignity. And the sooner we can get to policies that, that I think treat our, our, our neighbors and, and American people as people who wanna work, I think we avoid some of the traps of the rhetoric uh, on the right, which is people are lazy or people want to abuse and take advantage of the system. Of course, you're always gonna find people uh, who may fall into that category or may find ways that they just can't quite get back into the workforce. But I start with the premise that most people want to work because work brings dignity. And there's many ways, I think, to find that dignity. So I'll open it up now in the half an hour we've got, uh, Shane uh, and Julie, to questions. Um, I hope we covered enough kind of of, of, an, of an overview uh, to really talk about what, what you would like to talk about. Thanks very much, Kale. Um, and we've got some great questions here already. And I hope that you keep them coming because we've got um, just short of half an hour to continue to explore these topics here. And Kale, I'm going to start off by giving you a sort of omnibus question. And some of these came in before you talked about the Rural Online Initiative. And so you might have yep. answered some of these questions. 
Yep. Um, but maybe this is an opportunity to go into a little bit more detail here. Um, you mentioned that someone in rural Utah told you that their greatest export is their children. What can be done about that? Is that rural to urban flow of people for jobs inevitable? Um, Trent asked specifically about the rural online initiative. How will you, Trenton, sorry. How will you support the promotion and education to help Utah workers be able to work remotely and find work regardless of where they live, especially in rural areas? Bob asks about retraining and points out that a lot of pre-COVID jobs are gone and will not return. And Pat similarly asks, as a congressman, what kind of job training and or job development programs would you sponsor or support? So pick, take your pick of those questions. Yeah, thank you all um, for the omnibus approach. It's I won't I won't filibuster despite the omnibuster uh, uh, questions because they're all very good. Um, so to the point of some of these jobs are gone for good, I do believe that that's true. Um, it doesn't mean that the skill sets can't be transferred or that we can't get training that increases or diversifies diversifies those skill sets. But I think as the data starts to come out about what COVID is meaning for a number of different job categories is that things aren't going to completely go back to the way they were. And I think that is true in terms of the white collar management. You look at what, what space people may no longer need in terms of cubicles in a big open work environment versus sitting in front of your computer at home. And so I think the next wave of the debate is going to be, hey, if productivity has gone up, uh, to the point of working where you, you, from where you want to work. And if I forget, if you're in rural Utah asking that question, maybe you look out your window and you see a lot of red rock, you don't see skyscrapers. I think what Congress needs to do is to ensure that the connectivity allows you to do that. I know bandwidth we've talked about before. And I've said during the education discussion that what getting someone a Chromebook will do is important. But if that Chromebook for a, a teenager you know, in, in Cedar City doesn't connect sufficiently to, to the grid, uh, it won't matter, you know, that those Chromebooks are part of the, the federal legislation to, to make sure students have that ability uh, to plug in. So I think that's one of the things that I've learned uh, across my travel throughout the district. When we were down in Torrey, for example, I usually travel with our tech director and he's very smart on literally looking at a place and saying, hey, they're, they're connecting through um, you know, um, Wi-Fi throughout the town or they're connecting through something else. And so we were down in Torrey and we were walking with a and b owner and trying to, trying to determine where that actual connectivity point was. So I think that, that in rural Utah, uh, because some of the f outflow from our urban areas is going to continue, and that's based, I think, on a public health question. And I think we can all see it, that real estate prices are going up and places are being bought in remote parts of, of, of the state and in our country. And I think that that's a lifestyle choice. It's a public, a public health choice. And I think that will probably continue. Um, so I think that bandwidth is an issue. I think that the, um, the initiative that we talked about, what I liked about that, and, and I'm glad that, that Nancy shared it with me, is it's an actually, I think, realistic plan of focusing on specific geographic areas and then trying to find benchmarks. It's not a theoretical, well, we all need to help rural Utah. We need to help get those kids to stay if they choose to stay. When I was seeking the nomination, I remember talking to some delegates um, who were from rural Utah and they were now living in Northern Utah in the urban areas. And not all of them said they wanted to go back to a little town, um, but some of them did. And I think that in that way, until we, we get a better uh, option for those, those communities who want to give people more options, we're failing. Um, I don't think it's gonna be a quick uh, answer. I don't think it's just gonna come from a lot of federal dollars flowing in there. I think it's gonna be, for example, in places like Escalante, um, there have been interesting conversations about how to build uh, science and, and uh, geology type educational initiatives that would bring people there to take advantage of the amazing fossils that are found in Garfield County. Some of that, I think, has, has moved in the right direction, but, but not enough. We've got national parks in CD2, and I think a lot of the opportunities may come from how land becomes more of a magnet, not just for tourists, but for, for, for related initiatives around it. Uh, on the next trip I'm going to be on, I'm going to go deeper on some of the dark sky initiatives, and I believe there's a new one underway in, in Kanab, where some very entrepreneurial 
residents there are thinking about how to make Kane County and Kanab be part of that. These are dark skies too. These are areas you can come visit, learn, and then some of those jobs should, should flow from that. Retraining. Um, you know, I don't think it should be tied to certain industries and I don't think it should be tied to age. And I think that this is probably where we Democrats traditionally have been strong, but maybe we've lost some of the initiatives. I think that when economies change and maybe they go from old to green, um, there's a lot of fear that's built into that. Old industries, maybe the more predictable model that other generations had are no longer there. And when I talk to people who are younger than I am, and I'm a Gen Xer, um, they're living this too, which is they went to college, they took out the loans, and some of them are living back home. And they're not in rural Utah. Some of them are, but a lot of those are in, are in urban Utah. So how do you get the skill sets, I think, that, that are what industry needs? And I think that's where we could probably have some um, almost like job core functions. Uh, if we look at history, the, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, uh, what I love about CD2 is you, you drive around and you start to see little uh, historical monuments or you start to do a bit of your own history and you see that what the federal government did do at a time of great economic need is actually say to people, our goal is to get you working. So I think there are a lot of environmental opportunities. I think there's a lot of land related opportunities, but it's gonna take big thinking. And I, I guess I should have made that clear on the front end. Big thinking is what we need right now. Um, the Civilian Conservation Corps was there for a reason. And if these business leaders that I opened with are concerned about the dysfunction and blockage in Washington, it's time we think big. And that is probably gonna mean we're gonna look at a nationwide program Service is tied to that. I don't want to go into some of the plans I've looked at, but joining the military is one, one way to serve your country. Joining the State Department like I did is another way, but there should be ways locally to get some kind of fair deal, which is you graduate from college, you want to be involved in your local community. Here's a way to maybe forgive some student loan debt and to uh, get some real job experience. Those are some places I would start. Kelly, you're doing a really nice job of anticipating the questions before they're posed to you. Um, and a minute ago, you mentioned the gulf between wages and productivity, and Maggie asks precisely what can be done about that. Wages have been stagnant for decades, while productivity and profits continue to climb. Inflation over that period has decreased the spending power of dollars, and workers today are worse off than they were in the 70s. How can we course correct? Well, I think we can start by saying, how do we define a living wage? You know, um, that, that piece of legislation has been blocked, not by Democrats, it's been blocked by the other party. And, you know, some of the best jobs I have have been the lower paying jobs, but that doesn't mean I could live on the minimum wage that I used to, that I used to live on, like we all probably have, have had. Um, and I think what you need to do is get policies in place that don't focus necessarily on tax cuts first. And I think that's the big shift that, we Democrats, what is a fair tax? What is a fair system? And I think that this tax cut, that the corporate tax cut that was pushed through year one to Maggie, to your question, I think it's reflected in some of those decisions that flowed from that. If you look at the first round of COVID relief, one of the things I'm most proud about as a Democrat, a proud Democrat, I don't hide from that label in Utah, is, is that we focused on uh, employees. We focused on not allowing companies that said, hey, we're going to go under unless you, you help us. We learned that from the recession before, which was the stock buyback and CEO compensation. Um, one of the data points I used to talk about before COVID, and it kind of got lost in the red COVID cloud, is the difference between CEO pay, say, in the 60s and 70s compared to today. Do I think CEOs are valuable members of any community? Absolutely. But I think government has a legitimate role to say, if our um, inequality is at 1929 levels, that's probably not a symbol of a healthy economy, let alone a healthy society. So I think you're starting to see some of these CEOs, and it's not just Buffett, although he's very eloquent and powerful on this, saying, if our society means that Buffett's secretary or scheduler is paying more as a percentage of her or his income relative to a billionaire, something's messed up with that. Senator Warren takes a very proactive 
approach on that. I think she'll make a great treasury secretary, hopefully. And with her in charge, I think we'll see some of this consumer uh, focused and worker focused emphasis up there. I would also tie it, Maggie, to the role of labor. Um, you know, Republicans like to point fingers and say, you know, oh, labor, you only support labor because they all vote for you. And that's not where I'm coming from. I'm honored that I've got labor support. I'm honored that the AFL-CIO endorsed me before the convention. My understanding of why that balance is out of whack goes to living in Europe. It goes to what I studied as a, as a history double major with poli sci, which is in the past when you have labor at the table from the beginning, then you get more equality. Then you get a better relationship. Plus the companies and the CEOs should want that. And if they don't want that, then that's where I think Congress, through a proact type legislation, needs to come in and say, hey, you know, you're asking for, for, for a deal on this side, but you're not prepared to bring in the labor on this side. And I think that's where as someone who's instinctively kind of a mediator by nature, I would be pretty good at that. Okay, well, I'm going to abuse my privilege here by asking a question of my own, coming back sure. to the broadband issue. Yeah. I'm thinking about in the 20th century when regulations required the telecom giants to extend telephone service to the most remote rural areas. Would you be in favor of a bill that would make similar requirements of Comcast, the giant telecoms that provide internet service to extend broadband to remote rural Utah, for instance? Yes, I would. And again, Shane, it gets to when is legislating kind of at its best, in my view, it's it's finding what are the greatest needs for the for the for the public good. And I think again, we're at a point now where a lot of private industry and private companies are not saying we're fine on our own. What they're saying is we will go bankrupt without federal assistance. So as a, someone who used to negotiate formally for our country, <laughs> there's a huge amount of leverage in terms of when someone's saying, hey, we need your employees' tax dollars to help us survive. And that might be entirely legitimate. The airlines, you know, typically, well, let's not forget, the year before COVID, you had CEOs of airlines saying, we're never going to worry about bottom line. I mean, we're, we're swimming in money. And if any of you were flying last year, you know how busy those airports were. How quickly did that change to, dear Washington, without your bailouts, we're going to go under. And at least to the, to the credit of our government, run by Democrats in the House initially, to say, keep those employees um, paid. So when it comes to the rural-urban divide, I would say yes, because it gets to another issue of um, what is it that you expect people to pay for if they can afford it? When you look at utilities, right? Utilities are basically publicly regulated, right? There's a, a function for states and localities to look at utility rates. If people don't have power, I mean, some people didn't have power for a week after a windstorm, it's hard to do anything, let alone eat out of your refrigerator. So I think that there's an interesting model about public, you know, regulation is a dirty word for some people, but in my view, it would be about, hey, you benefit from what these tax dollars do roads, transportation, um, retirement, you know, public health in some ways, Medicaid for people who need it, Medicare for others who need it. So I think you would have to say, hey, if there's a way to get more of that to the rural areas, then yes, let's, let's incentivize it. You know, my, my instincts to incentivize versus punish, but sometimes I think it's okay to remind people that um, if you're gonna ask for help from the government, the government's going to probably say these are the needs that are not being met. Let's find a better way. I'll end with, with one example of a story. Um, when Ro I, I had a conversation with Rocky Mountain Power based on a personal house issue, and I remember the gentleman at Rocky Mountain Power, uh, I'd ask a question like, how do you help people that can't pay their bills? And he said, actually, we've got a program in place where we, we match funds. So if a neighbor down the road sees that maybe an elderly person or an unemployed person is having a hard time paying their bills, Rocky Mountain Power found a way to try and help in their own way. That, that's the best model, public-private. Um, and I think we're seeing it in other areas. Um, and that's probably a better way to get that bandwidth uh, to the communities that we need. And then there's you know some good philanthropy that goes on. But I'll tell you, philanthropy ain't going to close the gap with the needs we've got right now. We should thank the people who are generous, and there are a lot of them in our own community who are. I've got donors who are incredibly generous and fit that category. They have money to help. 
Um, but this is where government needs to come in and think big, think creatively, and also think constructively. Um, this should not be a, we know all the answers. There are areas where I'm sure private industry have legitimate uh, issues they're concerned about and also questions that they would have. But if you're achieving the same goal, which is to get students connected, to get employees able to connect in places they want to be, that's a win-win. Commercial real estate, that's going to be a, a tough place to be for a while, probably. Gail, I think you're going to like this question from Craig. <laughs> um, a fair bit of research demonstrates that the benefit of national monuments actually improves economic growth in the rural communities relative to peer communities without monuments. Um, and this goes against a lot of local sentiment that feels public lands and monuments retard economic growth. So the question is, how do we engage with those local communities to show that these public assets actually are a win-win economically for those communities? Craig, that's a great, great question. And why I spend time in Garfield and Escalant or Escalante, depending on which side of the debate you're on, um, is for that reason. Because when, when I think land is viewed as a national resource, that's going to be a national magnet. Um, then I think you can open up. And I've met with the mayor of, of Escalante. I know Chris Stewart hasn't met with her because I asked her. Um, and I just reached out to Garfield County commissioners, and they're all Republicans, to, to, to ask for five minutes on Monday. Is that I think, you know, when you look at land as a national asset and, and something that, that should help these communities, if you drive around Escalante or some of these small towns, you know, most of those jobs that are um, more um, enduring uh, and the, the business that buys the gas, buys the groceries, goes to the restaurant, goes to wherever they're looking to, to pass through. It's, it's tied to that tourism and tied to the effective management of that land that protects it, but also takes into account some of the other uses around perhaps the monument. So the Grand Staircase Escalante example is really interesting because it's become a hot issue. Um, because of some of the things that Chris Stewart was trying to do that didn't get any support about giving more local control over, uh, over that land. Um, so I think what you do is you start to basically have to bridge into areas you normally don't. And that's been one of the goals I've had. <clears throat> this campaign, <clears throat> Craig, is not just about <clears throat> where are the most voters. <clears throat> and I know that that's how you win. And we're focused on that. We know that more voters live in Salt Lake County and Washington County than in Garfield County or Wayne County or Beaver County. But politics is about finding the issues that you can actually um, bridge into. And then that translates, I think, to voters in the North, which is, hey, you like to camp. People down South live there all the time. How do you actually find that balance? Uh, how do you get national resources for park maintenance? It's about priorities. And if any of you have traveled to Springdale outside Zion National Park, you see a very interesting discussion always going on there which is tied to zoning. Springdale by and large has managed, I think their zoning well. You don't see 12, 14 story hotels right outside the park, um, but you also see questions of how do you raise revenue? Do you charge hourly you know, parking fees? They just instituted that I think about a year ago. Um, so I think it's, it's getting all the people in the room and that's a cliche, um, but I'm surprised at how often all the right people aren't in the same room. Um, when I go down to Garfield County, I should be in that room. I can't do it in every county that I'm running in. Um, but when I am in that room, it's a different conversation with some county commissioners. Um, and then I also think you just look at the data. You know, let's acknowledge the numbers. Um, most of the counties that, that are in CD2 uh, know where that revenue comes from. And I've been in meetings where they talk about the lack of motel tax revenue. Well, that's tied to COVID. And so if you ignore COVID and say, everything should open up. Those tourists aren't gonna come just because they can. Some of the local folks in you know, bordering states are gonna come, but we don't yet have the international tourists back. So it's about looking at the data, understanding it, and then being creative. I think the land provides great opportunities um, to be creative about how you uh, build jobs out of uh, what, what should stay there in, in as pristine a condition as we can, we can keep it. So our time is winding down and there's a couple of questions that I've been saving because they take us back to the bigger picture here. Yep. Rodney asks, if the coming election moves us beyond our current paralysis in Congress, what specific priorities would you emphasize to address the greatest economic needs for working Americans? And I might put an edge on this by asking you, 
more specifically, like what would be your three priorities when it comes to the economy? Well, I would say more rounds of, of COVID related relief. I mean, if uh, unfortunately my prediction is we're not gonna get any kind of big agreement between now and November. And then between November 4th and January 20th, we, we may have a president refusing to leave the White House regardless of the vote. So I think we'll have some first order concerns about constitutional crises um, that would take a lot of the focus. But as far as that, I would say, as long as the pandemic is real and it's been real from the very beginning and people are dying at the rate they are, uh, if government's gonna put, as I believe we should, public health first, then at a minimum, small businesses, people with unemployment need to, need to be helped. So those would be two areas, I think, small businesses, unemployment extension, whatever that level is. I mean, it was at 600, some people are talking less than that. So quick action on that. Um, I would say the living wage is always out there um, and that's gonna be an issue in the Senate uh, more than in the House. And if the Democrats, if we can take the Senate, then that'll move forward, I think, pretty quickly. And then finally, the third one uh, I would say is, is health, healthcare for all. You know, um, it's, it's really sort of the, the biggest risk I think people still have economically, which is if you lose your job, and the old model that your health insurance is tied to your job, there isn't a, a good then what. The Affordable Care Act has helped you know, 23 or so million Americans get into a system that's still not great for everyone, but at least they're part of it. So those would, those would be three. And then I would say um, over the longer term, trying to get labor back to all the tables they, they need to be at, and that traditionally they have been at that will help a lot of people because honestly, it'll help businesses too. It'll prevent a situation where you get major breakdowns from happening. I guess those would be four. So Andrew has a question um, that isn't specifically about the economy, but Kale, if yeah. you have an answer to it, I think you should be running for president instead of congressman. <laughs> With your excellent communication skills, how do you engage people who don't believe in facts and believe that opposing <laughs> views are fake news? Andrew, tell me more about you because let's let's schedule a call offline. I'll tell you all about it. It's a great question. Um, um, you know, honestly, I'm patient, but I'm not Job-like patient. Um, let's just put it this way. If someone's going to tell me conspiracy theories for half an hour, I will probably be a diligent listener for the first bit. But if there's not a two-way conversation, um, you can't go as far as I would like, right? So politics, I think, is about being pragmatic, but it's also not um, assuming um, without listening that a first impression is the enduring impression. We all never get a second chance to make the right first impression, right? That's just true. But I'm not worried about the first impression someone gives me, whether it's a right winger, whether it's a Trump voter, whether it's the far left delegate who honestly, gave me a litmus test of 12 questions before the nomination. Honestly, I was getting the, if you don't answer these 10 questions right as a Democrat, you're not a worthy Democrat to represent us in Congress. Well, fine, that's fair. And I listened to all that, but eventually I'd say, hey, you're giving me a, a, a litmus test that's not that different except for the categories and sometimes I'm gonna get from, from the Trumper. So why is it worth listening? I'll give you three examples and actually, is it, uh, it's well, well timed because after I get off this call, I'm going to be writing another message uh, and hopefully not burning the midnight candle before Lori and Julie and Shane all tell me it's due. Um, and it's this um, on Monday night, Ty and I, our tech director, spent two and a half hours with two libertarians on a podcast. Um, that is not easy, it's not predictable, and it's on the record all the time. It's recorded the whole way through. Um, most people would run away from that. But in order to understand why libertarians look at the two-party system as a complete failure, and one of, Jared's great, and he hosts it, and he says, I come from a democratic family, or did, but no more. How am I going to understand how that shift from, hey, we used to be good Democrats in my family, to, hey, no way, no how? Uh, I'm only going to get that if I sit in a podcast for two and a half hours with them. And I think Julie uh, Ty will work on getting that out. Um, fast forward to another case. Um, I 
think I had mentioned before that uh, Ryan Bundy had been on the receiving end of one of our texts, and it's of the Bundy clan. Um, I've said, to, I'll still talk to him. You arranged the call. And first thing he asked me was, do you know who I am? I said, I do. Uh, he started out with a long list of things that I wasn't going to obviously probably spend a lot of time on. But I finally said to Ryan, I said, is this going to be a conversation? Or is this going to be about you checking boxes? He first asked me, well, what, who do you think has the power or should be the most of most concern in our country? I said, it's meeting the needs of the people. And I said, I want a, a secure country that's not at war with itself. So how, how do I understand a Bundy take on, you know, taking on our federal government if I don't at least try and listen to him? And there wasn't a lot in that call that we agreed on, but I now understand the consistency, and I'll, I'll use that word, the consistency of a Ryan Bundy. If I'm in Congress, far better for me to have heard that than to just read an article in the New York Times about the Bundy standoff in Oregon. Um, and then a third I'll end with more locally. Um, this is helping me actually outline what I'm going to write, which is when we were down in King County in Kanab. And uh, I'll say hi to Carolee if you're on the call. I can only see some of you. Um, but after that, Stewart Town Hall, which was him wrapping himself in paper-thin patriotism, um, we said to Mr. Mike Noel, hey, would you like to talk? And it ended up being about another two-hour conversation. Um, and that's important. It's important also because I don't believe you're running to just represent your own party. Um, you're not just running to represent people who agree with you. Um, if I were only running in Salt Lake City, I would be like sitting outside working on my suntan. Um, that's not why I'm in this race. You know, I'm in this race to work hard. We've got a great team that's working hard. And that may mean that we only close the gap 40%. We may only close it 5% with some people. But I'm not in the business of politics to just reinforce what I already, be already believe or what I already know. And I think our country is at that point where it's easy to say they're different. They don't get it. They have different facts. And yet, if you hear it directly, sometimes you'll say, hey, I hadn't thought about it that way. It doesn't mean the facts have changed and the facts aren't negotiable. I mean, trust me, I'm a fact-based candidate. Um, but I think you can de-escalate that way. You can actually get in a room and say, hey, I'm here. And guess what? The Republican who's got the seat right now, when's the last time he actually took time to listen to you? One final story, and then I know where the witching hour is upon us. Um, Yesterday, Lori, our great campaign manager, who's very diligent in sharing information from people who say either you're doing it wrong or, you know, come from a different political view than I do. So I got an email from someone who had reached out, who had heard one of our radio ads. And the radio ad may have been on Hannity or it may have been on, you know, the 80s 103.1, which is where I like to hear it. Thanks, Julie. Um, but anyway, her point was, why are you talking about post offices? You know, post offices don't matter. And she said, rural voters don't matter. And this was not a liberal voter. I think this is a fairly conservative voter. So she said, why don't you talk about issues that are important to me? So Lori said, I don't know. Here's, and then, you know, so she handed it off to me. I was on our way to Dugway, and Dugway ended up being a very long trip, which we'll eventually write about. Um, but I like, no, I'm going to circle back and I'm going to call her. I got her voicemail, but when I left the voicemail, I didn't say, you know, you're full of one-sided uh, bigotry toward rural people. What I said instead was, Hey, you know, I heard you call. What are some of the issues that are important to you? I hope we get a chance to talk. Um, once you get someone on the phone, then you can, uh, go through the conversation. Um, but it would be easy to write that voter off as being someone who quote, just doesn't get it. Um, but if our country is going to survive, and I don't say that lightly, uh, we can't be a divided, dangerous, um, I did not even know the right word, um, we're at a precipice in a lot of ways. And we can either try and step back or we can push each other off. And right now we're pushing each other off the cliff. And that's not me. I will grab the Trumper. I'll grab the Democrat as much as I can. And if we all fall down together, guess what? We're all gonna be falling down together. So we're at that point where we need to make decisions about how close to the edge are we? I think we're pretty close. And are we gonna to start to try and step back? Final 
more hopeful point is by running in an incredibly gerrymandered district, um, I'm listening to people that I wouldn't be listening to if I were just in a democratic district or an overwhelmingly democratic district. To take those lessons to Washington will be where I think I could say, hey, Democratic Party, there are issues that can get us votes in places that you wouldn't expect at all. And here's how we do it nationwide. And then pick up the phone and call the most right-wing member of the freshman class of 2021 and say, hey, come out to Zion National Park and take a hike. We won't get too close to the side of the cliff, but we'll take a hike and see what can come out of a long hike. That's eventually where I think some of our best leaders have come from, which is get people out of their DC world and have the conversations. James Baker, who was a great Republican uh, Secretary of State, this is gonna have you have me talk about my old life, used to deal with the Russians where on the strategic arms talks. James Baker did not sit in a boring, stupid, whitewashed Washington room. He used to go fish out below the Tetons and have guys like Shepard Nadze talk about limiting nuclear weapons under the Tetons. That's what Utah could provide, I think, going forward, is a place to actually talk about real issues and come together as much as we can. My prior experience was doing it internationally. What I'd love to be able to do is do it inside our borders, because guess what? That cliff is real, and we're marching right up to the very edge of it. So thank you for an hour. I will put my blue shirt uh, on in about nine days or two weeks, whenever I'm told we're, we're, we're doing our next one. I know we have to be on the road uh, next week. Uh, we're going to be, to your point about bridging and, and trying to agree with people, um, we're going to do some events in Salt Lake, which I'm excited about, um, and then Davis County uh, again. But, but these are all what help me get uh, better when I'm doing town halls because we've got a great team that preps. We've got an amazing number of volunteers. And when you ask these questions, um, it reminds me of the stakes of this year. Um, and we're all part of, I think, getting us to a better place by November 4th. But we can't assume it's going to happen on its own because it won't. Our next message will be about that point. How do you, how do you, how do you cross the Grand Canyon size divide? Um, you, you reach and you hope your reach is far enough. Okay, well, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who left questions and I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of them. Um, conservatives say that their policies will create jobs by giving tax cuts to billionaires, and that has clearly not worked out for us so well in 2020. So it's time to replace Republicans like Chris Stewart with real progressives like Kale, with policies that are proven to create jobs and stimulate the economy. Um, thank you all for your support and pushing us towards this goalpost. Election day is 41 days away, and it's going to take all of us to win it. Uh, Julie, would you like to conclude by saying a few words? Julie is our finance director. Uh, sorry, communications director. <laughs> Not finance. <laughs> I'm Julie Bartel, the communications director. Thank you all for joining us today. Our next policy lunch is two weeks from today. Um, as mentioned, there will not be one next week. So we'll see you back. Um, I believe it's October 6th. We have um, a scheduling conflict on the 7th. Kale will talk about accountability and ethics in government. The Trump administration practices corruption and abuses its power at a scale that we've never seen before in American politics. So we need to talk about how to hold our leaders accountable to the principles of fairness, democracy, and ethical behavior. This is a big one. We hope you'll bring your questions and join us next week to talk about solutions. You can register through the link that you'll receive after this event. And thank you again for your presence today. We appreciate it. Thank you all. See you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you.